Well, what's up, what's up everybody? Um, so I'm going to be telling you guys a story today about Medellin. Um, in my journal, actually, this story is kind of convoluted between Medellin, Guadalupe, back to Medellin, and then to another area of uh, Colombia. But uh, I'm actually just going to be telling you guys a quick little story about Medellin the first time we were there. So we were there for about three or four days, and uh, I'm just going to read as, uh, as normal. One take, here we go. I'm going to read from the journal, and as the come commentary of the stories kind of pops up in my head, I'm just going to tell you guys what's happening. So um, I think the biggest revelation I had here in Medellin was right at the start when Kyle, Nico, and Caleb were keen to go out every night, and I made a conscious decision to stay behind and get a good night's rest and meditate each morning. The meditation practice has helped me stay calm, gain perspective on the bigger picture, and enjoy all moments of my travel, good and bad. Day one, we went off to a coffee biking and hiking tour, or so we thought. Turns out after two hours of driving, we showed up for just a coffee tour. And uh, we really, really were looking forward to going mountain biking and hiking and doing a coffee tour, but turns out the company we booked for, they do all three of those things, but uh, we only signed up for one, even though for the price we paid, we thought we were getting all three. We paid about, I think it was 120,000 Colombian pesos at the time, which was outrageous. Um, we realized that the guy who booked us in that thing at the hostel either scammed us or he just didn't understand what we were looking for. Uh, price aside, though, it was honestly a great authentic tour where we all learned a bunch about coffee production. And I remember the craziest thing as we were heading out there and everyone's like, oh man, Mitchell, you totally screwed us because none of them were planning anything. And I had no idea what to expect. But at the end of the day, the craziest thing I learned about the actual production of coffee at this tour was um, that Colombians actually export all of their coffee because the demand is so high low. Uh, globally that the locals can't afford to pay for the premium prices so a grade goes to the western world b grade coffee goes to the south american countries and c grade actually stays domestically and i remember this totally clicked with me because i was just sitting there going like oh my gosh this is coffee in colombia but what about the other goods in the world what about you know italian wine what about you know brazilian beef what about american dairy i don't know like all these things where are these products, you know, Canadian trees, uh, I look forward into like, you know, what about Canadian water, Canadian air, are these things, things that, you know, the local economies won't be able to afford and the global economy will have such a high price for down the road that we won't know what to do with other than to sell it and we won't be able to actually use our own resources in our own country um, because of the globalized economy and it was just kind of like a huge light bulb moment that overflowed my mind and even now I can't really even say that I've been able to make any drastic changes or more enlightenment on that on that note but it was really interesting and notable um, so after having the best coffee of my life at to date and seeing the facilities and getting toured up the farm by the tractor uh, the experience was over and it was really cool to you know see how coffee was picked from beans and then you know, shuffled all the way down these really long valley hills through these like open tubes and then it would come down to a production facility and they would jitter it and jitter it and jitter it into a point where they would, you know, be separating these things and they put them in bags and we saw this whole process come through and then we obviously got to drink some coffee and, you know, whenever you get to see every aspect of how a cup of coffee is made um, or how anything in general is made, it's really adds value to and perspective so you understand. And sorry, I've got the hiccups here. Um, it really brings perspective into, you know, everyone drinks coffee every single day, but does anyone really realize, like, how much effort it takes for a cup of coffee to be produced? It was just, you know, one of those moments in life where you kind of, it clicks that, hey, all this stuff takes a lot of effort and value to actually create and get to where you are taking and consuming that good or that service. And uh, so after all that was left, we turned turned back around and we got back in the car and we started heading back into town and I literally completely forgot about this but this was I mean amongst you know we had the other bus trips in Panama and getting in and out of there and some boat trips and there were some bad rides but and in Colombia but this was like the worst ride for me because uh at the start of the car ride I started getting an unsettling stomach in my in my gut and I just thought hey maybe like this this will pass it's just some gas and I'll be good to go, but unfortunately that was not the case. And by the end of the two hour car ride, I was moaning like somebody in labor as the knot in my stomach came and went slowly getting larger. And I mean, I remember it was like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And all of a sudden it was like, <gasps> I just couldn't even like 
fathom and maybe it was like the intensity of the coffee or something we must have had um, at lunch maybe at the coffee farm or on our way back but it was just like uh, way too much it was a very intense pain and I remember I, I'm sure the guys remember me just literally they were laughing and I was like crying in pain over in the side of the car because I, I was just had this huge knot in my my stomach and the next day Nico and Caleb uh, stayed in and Kyle and I ventured off to a free walking tour where I learned about the chaotic history of Colombia and Medellin and all that they have been through and for me it was really a story of inspiration about how much diversity and difficulty it, a country can go through in, in one specific time period and still come through um, and be so friendly towards each other and and to others and be forgetting about the past or, or to put the past behind them and the thought that the country can be so divided, you know, they have the left and the right and the drugs. So they had like the left political system, the right political system, and then they had the drugs and they had multiple drug, uh, basically, organizations that were running the country. That's how big they were. And they had all that divide in it that can still come back and be blossoming today is just incredible. Um, so yeah, it was just really cool to hear and understand that whole story of a country that had gone through, through so much turmoil and really come out of it blossoming and, and really friendly and everyone was amazing and very awesome people, especially in the Medellin area. And later that afternoon, we went up to a tram at the very end of the, the rail that they had in Medellin. The Medellin rail was really special for these people and I'll, I'll touch to that later, but we got on a tram that went off the rail that went up the valley. So then it went up to up the actual bench of the, up the valley and then up the mountain. So that this tram, with a couple girls and failed to meet up with Caleb and Nico and the tram experience was was definitely something of, a, of an experience. I realized there and then the impact the metro had had for the city and the surrounding areas. The line that kind of went in and out of this valley, so you have the valley and you had this metro line that really was like the equivalent of a metro line you'd see in Eastern Europe um, in Medellin, was, which was super cool. It gave these people hope to get to their jobs in town and let them to still live in the outskirts. And without these met the metro, these people would have le been left in poverty with no hope of ever escaping. So as we continued up the tram and the system over the national park where the tram glided above the jungle forest, like uh, <laughs> like something really like out of the Hunger Games. I mean, this thing went up and up and up, passing all the favelas, and eventually you stayed on the tram, you stayed on the tram, and it clumped over. And then there was this beautiful forest, and it was just, you were just floating on this tram line like in Roller Coaster Tycoon or in Hunger Games, just kind of going over and over and over the trees. And the ride down was also spectacular. I mean, up there we were walking through trails and it was really, it reminded me a lot of home. And it was just nice to get disconnected from the city life at that point with all of our experience with Bocas del Toro and Panama and Colombia uh, in Medellin these, this, that first day. And really just get on the trails and walking around and, and hanging out. And the tram ride down, I put here, was spectacular and gave me an even greater sense of the gratitude for my situation as the whole valley came down to dawn and the sunset behind the valley I could start to see the insanely vast area of the hillside that favelas took nearly the whole valley uh, that was just lit with incandescent lights millions of people lived in tiny shacks that scattered the hillside so this tram that went up and down the valley the entire valley for I don't know tens of kilometers um, up up a kilometer or two per side was just favelas, 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 favelas forever. And you could just see these lights starting to flicker out and flicker up into the night sky. And it was like, holy crap, all of these people live in this space. And yeah, you really, it just, uh, it does dawn on you when you're traveling in those areas and you start to realize that these people live here. This is what they do. This is their life. They have these experiences and this is what they call home and so many of these people never leave. They never leave Medellin. Um, so day three, we ventured off to Guadalupe. And at that point, actually, I'm gonna pause and not tell you guys any stories about what that experience was like for us because the Guadalupe experience for me was, yeah, it was, it was something else. So I'll let that story end there with uh, Medellin on our first take. It was a really cool experience to come into Medellin and be a part of a culture that everyone had really talked really highly of and all the hype and it was really cool to go on a couple tours and experiences around the city and to get a chance to engage with the city. The one thing I will note on uh, the Medellin side, so after we went to Guadalupe, we came back to Medellin and uh, 
I'm just gonna find it here really quickly. So that night we got back to the Galleria ho Hostel uh, for the second time. This is now on the return from, Guadal uh, from Guadalupe and we were welcomed with open arms by the staff and other guests. Uh, we were ready, skipped dinner and headed out to town where the local bars and with a group of travelers. Started at one of the bars and moved to the next. Eventually stopped to enjoy the fireworks and proceeded to the bar around the Pablado Park where people were gathered. Eventually we found a local salsa bar where Colombians we're dancing around and everyone was having a great time in this space. And you could honestly, like, you couldn't find a space in this square inch of this entire club where people weren't dancing and dancing and moving and shaking. And it was such a good vibe uh, all the way out into the street. And it was just a very festive night that we had come back from Guadalupe and we had this huge intention to get back and make sure we got back from Guadalupe at that time. And I remember the next day was fairly dull. We stuck around the hostel and played crib and discussed what our plans were going to be moving forward into the last leg of our trip. And that evening we switched over uh, to a, the, another hostel called Happy Buddha and booked a Pablo Escobar tour. So that night we headed off to the pub crawl and at the second bar I ended up getting my phone uh, stolen out of my pocket, which sucked. It was like in my pocket again, like, you know, with kids, kids these days, you know, the one the lesson the parents always teach me, my dad and my parents definitely taught me this was like, you know, put your phone in your shit in pockets with zippers in it. And I should have done that because I lost my phone and it was a devastating blow to the evening. But after giving a good effort for looking for it, I realized it was gone. Like there was no way we were going to get it up. So Caleb cheered me up and got me listening to the White Panda, this new album. And uh, they had just released it and I always loved listening to the White Panda's mixes. So we started listening to that White Panda and it was just like the whole night just kind of came back and I forgot about everything. And at the end of the day, I was personally quite... It, impressed with how I handled the whole situation at the end of the night. I was laughing that, you know, the whole reason I was so attached to this materialistic thing like phones and it is just slightly weird that I realized that night how we've evolved to be mesmerized by these flashy items that overstimulate our brain and give us too much extrospective while completely ignoring the introspective and reflection we're capable of performing. Apes, dolphins, whales, and us are among the only species capable of self-reflection, yet we immerse ourselves flaunting to others in social settings like many other creatures in the wild. Through this important, through this important life lesson and being socially, social requires a tremendous amount of intelligence. Most humans neglect their highest evolved past of the brain and don't self-reflect nearly enough. Um, Losing my phone helped me shed this light on the issue and showed me where I lied on the spectrum of self-reflection in human society as my biggest concern was losing my meditation streak. It was just ridiculous. I mean, I was sitting there like lost my phone and I'm thinking, oh man, I've got this meditation streak. And then I realized how daft the whole thing was like, who cares about the meditation streak, man? You're meditating because you should be able to stay present and you shouldn't actually care about this stupid little device. And once I started to kind of put those pieces together and put that past me, I mean, it is an important tool to have, but once I put that past me, you know, everything was fine. And we realized that the next day was just another slow day. And we ended up heading out to, uh, we headed out to a, a mall and I was sitting there going, okay, well, if I don't have a phone anymore, I should probably buy something that allows me to connect with the world, uh, the digital world at least and uh, allow me to stay connected with my family in case I get lost or anything happens to me. So we went and negotiated for some, negotiated, uh, negotiated for some tablets and just needed that to get, up, to get out. And so that was pretty much the entirety of our experience in Medellin. It was a lot of nightlife, a lot of, you know, a couple tours, but like I said, I'll give you guys the tour of what happened in Guadalupe at the next, uh, next chance I get to record some videos and we're getting close to the end of all these journeys. So I hope you guys are enjoying these videos. Sorry if this one was a bit scattered brained. I'm uh, currently just in a little bit of a weird spot, but I want to make sure that I get all these videos recorded uh, before I get out and about again. So we'll catch you guys in a minute. I hope you guys are enjoying these videos and we'll talk to you later.